Hey everybody, Jason Burmis here, and you are in store for yet another Mixed Martial Mindset with the one and only John Fitch, MMA legend, superstar, 170 champion one day. I mean, are we going to get this fight, John? I mean, we watched a couple of incred uh, incredible uh, fights this weekend. The 170 fight lived up to the hype, in my opinion. That's the way you want to close out the year in a show. We're going to go over those fights. Um, but is there any word on you and Lima in Bellator? No word yet. There's still, there's no, it hasn't been a no. So as long as there is not a no, we're still, we're still game, maybe. <laughs> hey, dude, li listen, there's no way it should be a no. We're going to go over the entire card. We're going to go over Covington. And I want to go over something you said before the fights um, about Covington kind of being a, cr a grifter with this persona. And um, mm. it is a persona, right? Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, and, and we'll go over it. all that. Before we get to it... He's no more that person than the Iron Sheik is. <laughs> the Iron Sheik or Mikhail Garbage or whatever. Mikhail Volkov. Uh, it was Nikolai Volkov, sir. Nikolai, yeah. And one of my fondest memories was going to the Madison Square Garden for the very first time for my 10th birthday, front row, mm. to see Nikolai Volkov. In a mm. singles match. It wasn't even... Because they were the tag team, him and uh, the yeah. Sheik. Yeah, you yeah. got two stereotypes together. Two enemies yep. in one. Go America. <laughs> yep. All right. So we've got uh, a YouTube channel you probably want to subscribe to right now. That is uh, YouTube.com slash Official John Fitch. That where, that's where you can see John Fitch knows nothing. I know you had an interview lined up this weekend. I guess it must have fell through. But you can check out <laughs> everything John Fitch uh, dot net right here, including the YouTube, but go subscribe right now. You get the audio mm. podcast of this after the show over at the grueling truth.com. And like we said, we're going to get into Colby and all the fights in a moment, but yeah, what happened? You get, you get stiff armed in that interview or what happened? Uh, no, he just, uh, so it was, um, it was supposed to be a podcast, a little interview with, uh, a, a psychic basically. <laughs> and, um, just before, you know, five minutes before we were supposed to go live, they reached out and said they're having some internet problems, which was confusing because he, I mean, he should have seen that coming. <laughs> right? I, he should, I mean, that's something. He, he should have, know. you know, he should, he, I should have gotten a little bit more heads up than five minutes. I was like ready to go. Yeah, because you know, I had maybe. retweeted it and then I, I, uh, I left and I'm like, oh yeah, that's right, this interview is going on. And I went to click it, and it wasn't there. I was kind of disappointed. But you yeah. have been up in the game. You have been doing more interviews, really interesting stuff over there. Mm -hmm. You did recap most of the main card, not yes. uh, any of the prelims. No, no, yeah, I didn't touch the prelims. I did I did a 5-hour uh, and 44-minute long live stream of the fights, though. Oh, that's right, um, you did. I did. I watched, watched a lot of the fights, and um, I ate a whole chicken <laughs> and drank a whole bottle of wine. Yeah, you know what? I was I was wondering, I because I, I was tuning in and out uh, of you. I wasn't watching the whole thing because you know I was trying to catch the thing, and then you were like thirty seconds ahead of me at a time. So I was like, oh, I don't want to ruin this. But yeah, it did seem like you might have gotten a little tipsy at the end there. I uh, yeah, I was uh, drunk on chicken, chicken chemicals. I don't know <laughs> if it was organic. <laughs> drunk on chicken chemicals. That's good stuff right there. Let's get you in this scene. I forget that I. I bang that out. All right, so let's start talking some of these fights. Now, i got to scroll down so they can go right over your head. <laughs> you missed this in the early prelims, but uh, this Soriano guy knocked uh, Oscar Pachea out cold. Uh, pretty mm. exciting. I think it was a – I'm pretty sure it was either – what was it? In the, in the first? Yeah, first round KO. So, you know, kind of a banger back and forth, early guys. Fun fight to watch. Jessica I, who is ranked, I think – two or three in that division she came mm. in six pounds overweight man she, <sighs> that's yeah. well i have a book coming out um this next year I, i'm still working on the title but it's a weight cutting book i'm just tell i tell everybody what i'm doing what i'm what's going on with the book i kind of keep it light and funny it's going to be a cheap book like five bucks maybe something like that but uh she can uh she can get a copy and then she should be okay you think that? <laughs> you would think that. Uh, then we've got uh, Brandon Marino versus uh, 
I forget what his name was, but France was the end. It was actually a really competitive bout. It was a banger if you didn't get to see it. Um, flyweights, man. And, and Marino, he's a ranked fighter. I think he was ranked five going into this. He, he has exciting fights. Even when he loses, he's really exciting. And then this kid actually made it to the prelims. Uh, they showed his fight because they're trying to push him. He was on the Contender Series. It was that lanky Chase Hooper kid. He's 20 yep. years old and uh, the youngest uh, fighter in the UFC. You caught that one, didn't you? Uh, they they did a replay. Yes. They did do a replay. And, um, yeah, he's going to be really tough when his testicles drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but all right. Let's talk about that, though, John. I know, listen. But no, it's amazing. He It wasn't like um, – it's not just, oh, some kid won a fight. He – Put together a chain of attacks that was not the level of a normal twenty-year-old. You don't see that level of chain attacks from from the majority of fighters today, right? Uh, they just jump into the pocket, close their eyes, and throw combinations. It seems like that's what the majority of people do. This guy, he he not only went for like subs and control positions, but he had escape routes and he knew how to get and uh, maximize the potential of each situation that he was in. Like it was just very smooth, very crisp, very high level stuff. The guy's uh, got a very bright future ahead of him. I just hope that he doesn't um, have shitty people around him that just want to fucking make that money off of him quick and it, it eats him up fast. I hope he keeps an uh, uh, um, even tempered mindset about the stuff. Take your time. Don't rush into anything. Don't be afraid to say no to fights. You have a lot of power in saying no. Make sure you're healthy. Make sure it's the right matchups. Like, don't don't fuck your career up because you're trying to take off too much too soon, or you're allowing the the fucking promoter to lead you. Yeah, they, they are I, not I, looking out for your best interest in any way, shape, or form. Don't don't get Sage Northcutted. You know, yep. I mean, like Sage Northcut. There was a promising striker. You know, good looking kid. Probably somebody you could have pushed. You push him yep. way too far. As soon as he lost to Mickey Gall, that that fight makes sense, right? You put that fight in there, I get it. But then you put him in there with somebody like Bob Arena. Bob Arena gets gives every top 15 guy he fights a, a hell of a time if he doesn't beat them. So, you know, uh, I just think that you're, you're right. You need to build this guy, especially because he came in there, in my opinion, really nervous. No reason not to. I think it showed, uh, especially in his striking defense. Not that I know that he has a lot of striking offense, but he got clipped a couple times. He looked uncomfortable. It looked like... As that first round went on and he was pulling guard, he was getting close, he was doing those, he got a lot more comfortable. But, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, he's a big, lanky guy for that. Was he 6'2"? Six 6'2 two? Six two for that division? Is he really 6'2"? I think oh, he was 6'2". I think he came in at 6'2". He was wild. a. Gi- I remember looking at him and saying, man, this kid is a giant for that division. And uh, I think he's got a lot of potential. Like you said, uh, let's not rush him. Let's not, give him a, let's not give him a top 20 guy. Let's give him a guy with 10 fights like he has. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. A similar record, maybe with two or three losses. Give him a seven and three guy. I'm fine with that. Maybe a seven and three guy mm-hmm. that's lost to a top fifteen fighter. You know, make it competitive. I want it competitive, but at the same time, like you said, when when you push guys too quick, you get into a situation where they drop so many in a row, and that's it. You don't see them. You know, their careers what in the UFC or main main organizations like Bellator and what three four years. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's pretty sad. Yeah, so, I, I mean, and it's not even, uh, you know, taking too big of fights too soon, but, like, even fighting too often too soon, you know, allow your body to heal, let it, let it recover, and then give yourself a time to focus on uh, um, skill set training, right? R- refine your skills even more before you get into the next fight so that you're, you're, you're a level up. You're, you're not the same person you were. Uh, your chances of leveling up with your skill set if you're if you're fighting every three months it's it's hard like you need to get yourself to be like okay i'm championship level and then go into that into that uh into that pace but he's probably got you know he's got a little bit longer to go to to be at that spot so just chill you know you're 20 you don't have to worry about it i mean don't even think about you know give yourself five you know if you're like okay i want i'm looking for my first title shot when i'm 25 (laughs) Uh-huh. <laughs> well, all right. Let's you're talk still about a baby. that. Quick. You're still a baby, and and you you've 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 had five years to progress into an absolute killer. Mm-hmm. 
Well, I, all right, let's say this. I think around 24, 25, especially if you've been a pro for five or six years, is really the prime uh, of a guy's career. I know a lot of people like to say it's like in that 28 to 32 range. And don't mm-hmm. get me wrong, somebody like a Corey Anderson, yeah, for sure. But mm-hmm. I, for one, think John Jones was much more dangerous seven years ago than he is right now. You know, Tiago Santos arguably won that. I mean, that's, that can also be a little bit of complacency and, you know, all the trouble he's had and time off he's had, like... Well, exactly. I mean, look, not everybody, you were talking three months, right? Not everybody's Josh fucking near, right? Not everybody's going in there, you know, every few months going to fight whoever, and I get that. Um, You know, and and more than likely, if you are that guy, you're kind of end up being a journeyman. You end up being Josh near, you know, an Mm -hmm. entertaining fighter. A guy like me loves to watch him fight. I loved his career, but, you know, was he ever top 15? Did he ever get that title shot? Did he ever make that money in the UFC? No, unfortunately, Mm -hmm. he didn't. And, you know, I guess moving on to the next fight, here's two guys that have kind of been those journeyman type of fighters. Matt Brown coming back now. Matt Brown, a real contender at one point, strung together some big-ass victories. But then when he got into that top five realm, that was pretty much it. And, uh, you know, I think it got in his head. Um, First of all, it it started out with the wrestling. He he didn't have that top, top top-level wrestling that you needed. He got that fight with Lawler and I think that was the big difference in that fight in my opinion you know and and not that Robbie's not a killer but uh and and by the way props to Matt Brown I love Ben Saunders Ben Saunders is a guy who could take on a top 15 any day of the week you know give or take good striker good jujitsu lanky um but Matt Brown comes back entertaining fight give me your take on it you know it was it was great uh Ben Saunders was doing some really great jujitsu early on but he got away from, you know, he, he isolated with the rubber guard, pushed away and created some space, and then started throwing elbows the front, from his back, the three to six elbows, or three to nine elbows. Amazing. He should have kept on that, but he kept chasing that rubber guard, but he stopped striking. He stopped doing any damage. Uh, and then he ended up just, just kind of holding himself in one place. Like, there's no movement, no space being created. He's just, he's just holding on to something in desperation, it kind of seemed like. So he... He, he passed up on a lot of opportunities to, to sweep or get up on top or get back to his feet chasing, uh, I call it fishing for, for submissions. Like, like once the guy becomes aware of what the submission's coming is, like he shuts down. It becomes very difficult to submit the guy. So if you don't, even ha- if you don't have a, uh, a, a, an exit strategy, a way to get back up to your feet or sweep, you're, you're in trouble. And if you don't have a way to inflict damage from there, also you're in trouble because then now you're just stuck. You're stuck, and then you end up doing what he was kind of doing, which is looking up to the ref. Hey, there's no action. Stand us up. And I, I absolutely hate that. I hate that that's an actual incentive that we have in this sport. That hey, if you can stop the fight from your back, you'll be rewarded with standing up. That's insanity to me. Absolute <laughs> insanity to me. Like, I know then, you and, hate the stand ups. And, and then the and then the guy on well, it's not even it's it's the guy on top then gets criticized for being slow. Well, like I'm sorry, same thing with the Randall Main fight. She started shutting down on bottom and just closing guard and holding uh, Amanda Nunes in her guard, like trying to stop her from hitting her. Mm-hmm. That's not fighting. You're you're waiting, you're stalling, waiting for the fight to be stood up. Like it's not Nunes' fault for for not having as much action. It's the person who's stalling, the actual person who's stalling. Punish the person who's stalling and stopping the fight. That's a tough one, though. What do you do in that situation? Do you go back to like the yellow card system? I think like- I think you have to. I think there's no you, you either you either let them sit there and lose on their back doing nothing, and 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 make sure the crowd and your announcers and everybody's talking about the person on bottom. It's like, oh well, the person on top can't go throw any punches because the person on bottom's stalling. Everybody needs to know mm-hmm. that the reason there's no action is the person on bottom is stalling, trying to get stood up. All right. Everybody knows that it puts more pressure on that person. It takes away incentive because now it's a, you're free. It's a free ride because everybody's like, oh, yeah, that person's just a lay and pray. You're like, well, wait a minute. The, the person on their back is the one that was stopping the action. How are you blaming the person on top? Yeah, but then that kind of almost makes a uh, rubber guard or something like that useless. Sure, you're stopping the fight and you're moving out. Like you said, Saunders not really going for the submission but taking mm-hmm. away the offense, then they, you might get penalized. I don't know. I think it's a slippery slope, Mr. Fitch, but you would know better than me. You've been in a lot more guards uh, than I'll well, ever be right. in my that's life. That's what I say. Like, if you add the yellow cards, you are, you're adding a rule. That's why I think, I think you don't do anything. You, you don't do the stand-ups, but you make sure everybody knows 
the reason why this action stopped. Mm-hmm. It's not the guy on top. <laughs> well, look, listen. We can get into announcing after we go over the card because, goddamn, that is tough to listen to. Like when I, I, turned, was... I don't, I stopped listening to that a long time ago. Those <laughs> guys, everybody's just pushing the env- company envelope. It's talking points. It's no different than political correspondence giving you the same exact freaking talking points. It's the same, one hundred percent. P three protein, show. Conor McGregor, it's, cowboy. It's pro wrestling. It's pro wrestling, <laughs> right? Me and Gene Okerlund's going to say what he was told to say. <laughs> All right. Uh, again. Congrats to Matt Brown. Very cool awesome fight. Awesome fight, Matt Brown. Yeah. And Ben Saunders looked great, too. I think he just... He I think just Ben Saunders is all right. He should have gotten away from that rubber guard and been a little bit more active. Throw, if he would have kept on those elbows, creating space, throwing elbows, that would have been great. He, he's a guy that trades uh, wins and losses often. They're both tough uh, alum. Ben Saunders, all the way back in 2007, me and my brother looked it up. We were watching that fight. I mean, he, he's a veteran. I've seen him live a couple times, man. He's always pretty entertaining. I, you know, Bellator and uh, and UFC alum. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a guy who'll yeah. take a fight. Middleweight fight. Uh, you know, you got Ian Heinish, who really, boy, what a three-rounder. Akhmedov took it to him, in my opinion. Like, really mm-hmm. exposed Heinish. Hurt him. A lot of heart in Heinish. But... Akhmedov was next level. Mm-hmm. I think there was, uh, man, they're both a little bit sloppy. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel like they waste a lot of energy because their punches and stuff aren't as tight. Well, I mean, a lot of people came in pretty muscled, John. That's all I'm going to say after those new USADA they, rules. <laughs> I, I mean, I've seen Akhmedov fight before, and don't <laughs> get me wrong, he's a big dude. But when I saw him come in, when I saw Marais come in, we'll come in with that. Like, Marais is a big dude. But Marais looked like like it's hammer time. I was like, are those biceps cartoon? Like, like is this a video game? My God. <laughs> so, and, you know, Aldo notoriously fought in Brazil forever for a reason. Let's, don't, let's not get it twisted. Uh, and, again, I know diuretics are supposedly illegal in the UFC too, but, you know, to make 135, and he looked real good, we'll get there. I'm just saying things might, things are, I, I truly believe now in this Disney era with this, press conference with the Conor McGregor cover-up now a year plus strong. Congratulations, guys. You've really made it into a fucking really dishonest entertainment machine where you can do whatever the fuck you want. You have a fucking wrestling superstar Hollywood actor come in there with a fucking belt and you sell more pay-per-views than you did all year. And uh, by the way, Dana White did this interview with uh, Kevin Ioli. Yep. Now, Kevin Ioli. Kevin uh, Ioli is trash. Oh, we're going to get into it. So, he's trash. So, he's a hit. He's a hitman, paid company guy by the UFC. Always has been. He is never going to give you a fair shake in an interview. He's always going to side with the UFC and try to shame you. He's like he's like Brian Stetler or whatever. Freaking <laughs> CNN, dude. One hundred. He could be his uncle. They look he's pretty the, similar. He's the Brian Stetler of freaking MMA news. <laughs> We well, call it news. It's PR. He's mean gene. He's but not less entertaining. Well, the, well, the thing was that Ioli writes this piece about McGregor's sexual assault on Yahoo News, right? And this is the end of November. He's the only guy doing it. But at the end of the day, he's like, well, he hasn't been charged, and a man deserves to make a living, so the fight should happen. But, you know, they always cover their ass. If it did happen, it's a heinous crime, and he should go to jail. You know, all that bullshit. And I called them out on it. I do this video. Lo and behold, that week, he's fucking sit down with Dana White, 22-minute interview with Kevin Ioli. Trying to get ahead of it. Well, then Ioli goes, it was hilarious, John. There were so many, if you haven't seen my breakdown of it, you need to. It's it's that pinned tweet I have, and then I re-threaded that banned thread. We did it live. I did After mm-hmm. I did that, I did the live thread on that video saying, this is what they don't want you to know. So Kevin Ioli finally says to him, he goes, you know, we've talked about this off camera, Dana. Let's talk about it on. (laughs) Oh, you mean Kevin fucking Ioli and every other MMA fucking journalist has talked to Dana White about the fucking facts that the, the Irish media has reported that Conor McGregor brutally beat, anally raped, and fucking (laughs) raped a chick on her period in front of people? You mean that, Kevin? You know, and they all soft blow it. Can you imagine what they've said to this guy in fucking private? I mean, seriously, right? I mean, I'm not in imagination land. So then 
you, con- confirmation. At least I, Kevin, I don't say anything. They probably just get told. They get told, and they're like, "Oh, okay, yes, sir." Okay. <laughs> well, no, they, listen. Whatever you say, boss. Whatever well, you say. Well, listen. They had that conversation. So then he goes. It, it was. It was like two and a half minutes of Dana very uncomfortable, because I only even asked him like. He's like, well, have you put any investigators on it? Dana White does not answer the question. <laughs> Immediately just moves it over. When he brings up the New York Times article, bringing it up, he's like, right before that, he goes, wait, is it out yet? Like, he, 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 he like, asks if all the information that all the Irish press is there, is it out? And he goes, <clears throat> he goes, oh, well, the New York Times. He's like, well. Yeah, the New York Times, but there's no other stories about Conor McGregor out there. And, of course, all those other stories are there. I mean, it was so fucking bad. And then they just move on. It was towards the end of the interview. They're trying to get out ahead of it. The tickets go on sale in four days. You know what I mean? They put up that shitty fucking uh, promo during the show. I knew we were going to have to watch it. It was terrible. It made me sick. Guys. Hammer it home. I want to. I want to. I want to just say this now. Hammer it the fuck home. It's pinned. It's right here. The thread is still not shadow banned. Everything is there. Again, high level police source. At the end of the day, there is no doubt this young lady suffered a horrendous ordeal. The examinations and all of the evidence shows that she was raped and very badly assaulted in that penthouse suite. That includes statements that are hugely detailed and complex and go into minute detail of every aspect, every aspect of the night and the attack. I didn't print this shit. (laughs) I'm not the witness testimony. I'm not the forensic examiner. I mean, dude, I go on. Here it is. It's right here. Tweeted at Dana fucking White and every other MMA fan out there if you want the truth, if you're not in denial. Because I'm doing everything I can not to let this guy get paid on January 18th. I don't want to see him naked. You know what else really made me fucking sick, Fitch? While they're having the interview and they're talking about McGregor before they get to the rape stuff, they're like, um, you know, number one combat sports pay-per-view of all time, Fitch, is that fucking Floyd Mayweather bullshit. Number one. You think they brought that up when they were negotiating with fucking ESPN and Disney to sell those deals? Numero uno. Number one. Number one. So let's let's make sure it's not number one anymore, guys. Let's let's make sure that fight doesn't happen. All right. Let's get back into it to the next banger. Because again, as much as I want to criticize that, good job, UFC. UFC 245 matchmaker, good job. This was a woman's fight with high level striking, and it was a really fun fight to watch. They both made weight. Aldana and Vieira. Yep. Give give us your thoughts. Fight. This is a great fight. Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, I'm not used to seeing as high a skill set from a lot of the a lot of the girls. Um, they they were they were really tough. Um, I was saying uh, Aldana has a little bit of a herky jerky type of style with the head movement that I kind of think of uh, Keith Jardine. Thinking back, right? I love Jardine. Like, yeah, I love Jardine. <laughs> Hard, uh, kind of a hard thing to like pick up a pace and 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 time and hit. Because it's it's a little bit off. She mm-hmm. wasn't as as jerky as Jardine. She was a little smoother than Jardine, but it, it kind of reminded me of it a little bit. Man. And she's got super long arms, and like when you her, her fight somebody with with that length, like the the angles that they can land those punches at are kind of weird, and um, you don't really see some of them coming. Uh, the timing's off because like you think you're slipping out of the way, and by the time it gets there, you're getting hit by it. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a good fight all the way through. I had uh, was it Vieira? I had uh, Vienna, winning yeah. Up until uh, the knockout, I was I oh, had Vieira, her slightly right. ahead. Yeah, no, she was nasty. Listen, man, she was bulldozing forward. The, you know, she got clipped with that one. Uh, what was it? An overhand? And then she uh, got followed up on the ground when she hit. Was it an overhand or a hook? No, she caught her with the hook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, and it was uh, kind of came forward and, and dropped dropped the right and the hook. It was it was a perfectly placed uh, uh, hook, pow, right in the kisser. And talking about perfect, right? Can't say much about this uh, one seventy performance. Jeff Neal's going to be problems with guys, man. I, I've seen his wrestling; it's pretty top level. Mike Perry's got a good chin. He usually bangs with people. This one went down in ninety seconds. Be, be part of the problem. <laughs> 
Could be. Hey, Chins, Could be. Don't last forever, man. Just because you, you you banged out a lot of fights, there's a good chance your next fight, you're not going to get a bang as much. Well, I'll tell you what. What do you think? Who who does Jeff Neal get next? You, you give him a top 10 guy, right? Who do you give him in the top 10 in the UFC? Probably. I'm not all that familiar with everybody in the top 10, other than I, I'm pretty sure I can beat him. <laughs> Somebody posted the top 15 the other day, and I, I'd mentioned that, you know, I'm an old yeah. fart, and I could still beat all those guys. Well, you know what, John? We do it live here sometimes. So top 15 UFC mm. welterweight. I'm sure Cowboys rank somewhere in there. I'm sure he's in the, in the, mm. uh, Cowboy, in the deal. Let's yeah. see. Everybody got to see that I spelled welterweight wrong. That's me. All right. So here's all the rankings. Where are we at? Those are... Why why would you have pound for pound right there? Get that get that garbage out of here. I don't need to see that right now. All right. So at the bottom, yeah, Neil Magny. If you Magny, had 20 fights, you don't belong on a pound for pound list. Yeah. Jeff Neal's already at 14. Magny doesn't make sense. Luke's tough doesn't make sense. Gilbert Burns, I almost think that's a gift putting him at 12. Lawler, that's a fight you can sell. Boy, I don't know if Robbie Lawler should take that fight. Like, that's a, you know... Robbie, how many bangers you want to do before it's all over, bro? Well, they're uh, they might put him with Lawler because he's been fighting a long time. He might make too much money. They might want to get rid of him. And he, he, and you know what? It's the tail end of his career. Um, yep. it, it's a payday. They get to build a name off of Neil. Lawler's a big name, and it could be a big fight. Like Lawler's not laying down for anybody. Um, to me, Pettis, you can also sell. That makes more sense to me. Even though Pettis lost his last fight to uh, Diaz, I believe it was, right? Did he have another one after that? Not that I can recall. Yeah, I don't, I'm How not many sure. fights has he had at 170? What's that? Uh, I think Diaz was either his second or third fight at 170. Mm-hmm. He, he had an impressive first fight at 170. I forget who he, he took, but he took a legit guy. He should be ranked. I'm down with that. Nate Diaz isn't fighting anybody for less than a million dollars, so I'm sorry, Jeff. You're not getting that fight. <laughs> Um, Steven Thompson won his last fight. Top, that's the, that's the fight I like. I like, I like either Ponzinibbio or, or, or Thompson for this guy. He, he's, uh, he says he wants two or three more fights, which I think is right before he goes to the top level. Uh, I think that Steven Thompson is a good one because he's probably tailing off on his career, has not fought as many wars as Robbie Lawler. And, you know, his striking style is something that could maybe give him problems. I don't know. What are you, what are your thoughts on that fight? No, I think, uh, yeah, those could be good fights. I haven't, I haven't seen uh, Paz and Ebo fight, uh, so I can't make a judgment on that. But, yeah, Wonder Boy, that would be fun. Um, Lawler, yeah. Well, they don't want to give him Damian Maya because that could just end Jeff Neal's Neil, train like it ends so many trains. Like, Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's, they're, they're, yeah they're probably going to steer clear of uh, you know, a wrestler that could um, – beat him in a you know take down ground and pound fashion no it makes more sense i think that you know he gets through thompson and then maybe dos Anjos, uh doesn't fight or or you that could know. be a good one too. yeah dos Anjos. yeah uh, well again if he wants two or three steven thompson dos Anjos champion that makes sense to me ufc i mean uh, I'm, I'm no joe silva i guess but <laughs> you're way too tall you're like at least twice as tall as uh, am i really because because yeah. i get i get hassled about my height all the time john He's oh. like four one with the four inch lifts. <laughs> All right, and into the main card, which was juicy. It was fun. It was good. Um, you had, uh, let's see, you had Faber versus Jan. Jan's a serious dude. He looked really good. He came in. I think it was almost four to one. Um, I but hey, Faber looked. I'm not. Looked I'm good. not shitting on him. He looked good. Yeah, I don't. Um... I, I, as far as performance goes, I think he looked good. I think he looked a little bit tentative. Um, he was running in a little bit, but it's kind of his style a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would like to see him like try to try to clinch up, try to get in on the leg, try to you know, because he's got a, a powerful stand up fighter like Jan. Like get him tired. You know, uh, you know what? what does Faber about retire after it's this? Not even about being on top. It's about it's about making him pummel, making him work, making mm-hmm. him fight, and and. Uh, blowing his arms up so it's harder for him to be as, as quick and fast with a lot of those punches power is going to still be there but like you can get him to 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 cut back on the volume by by clinching him up a little bit I, I mean again Jan I think he's top five I think in that division bantamweight Marice can knock anybody's head off in the first 90 seconds to to mm. five minutes of a fight 
he seems to slow down because he wants to go for it. I mean, we'll, we'll get into that fight in a second. Um, Cejudo is making money now. He's not giving anybody a fight he can't sell, in my opinion. In fact, I hear he, he's talking to the WWE, which is funny because Cejudo's, what, 5'2"? <laughs> like, yeah, do you want to talk? Major. So that would be that could be actually some kind of funny. Uh, that could yeah. be funny. Make, Having a tag make, match with the with the big show, you know, make him make him wrestle the biggest guy they have in the organization, the tallest, biggest fucking dude they can get. That would be fucking awesome. <laughs> I would. I don't even like pro wrestling, but I know that that would just be awesome. Just I love in, it. Bring in Thor John, Thor Johnson or something like that, or <laughs> the Mountain. You know, so bring us some giant with favor. <laughs> One, I'm glad they didn't interview him after the fight. I, I'm sick of them ever interviewing these guys that get knocked around or KO'd after the fight. I'm glad they didn't. Um, does he fight again in the UFC? I mean, I, I, you think he would because, again, this is a top five guy. He looked pretty good against them. There were moments where you, you could have said it, it looked like he could have won. Or does he hang it up now? I mean, what, he's 42? 40, I thought. Is he? I'm pretty Are sure you he's sure? Hurt. He's a baby. He's a baby? No. Fitch. Pretty sure Uriah Faber is 40 years old. Uriah Faber. Let's see what we got for the Fabes. Oh, he's 79. He is 40. He's younger than me. Oh, oh no, he's he's a little old. He's two months older than me. God, that's I remember scary. The, uh, I remember the graphic. I saw it somewhere. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So then, uh, moving on to the Marais Aldo fight. First of all, do you have it for Marais? Do you have it for Aldo? Um, I thought Marais did squeak out the win. Mm-hmm. I think Aldo very easily could have won the fight if he would have thrown some freaking leg kicks. What the hell? We're, Jose Aldo and no leg kicks. What bizarro land world are we living in? <laughs> what happened? Especially, especially in a situation when you have a guy who's using a shitload of a, a, a lateral movement back and forth and back and forth. When they're moving that fast back and forth, they have a harder time checking. It's harder to check when you're moving like that. Why isn't he just chop, 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 chop? Make him stop moving back and forth. Like, he ended up chasing him around the ring a little bit because of that. And then he's walking into punches. So, uh, I think Marias um, squeaked that out, yeah. But um, I was really surprised at how well uh, Aldo did and how good he looked at 135 like the yeah. first couple times he got hit I was like oh oh like because usually sometimes you cut the weight and the water is too much and your chin goes like there's not enough fluid in your brain to keep you from getting the lights turned out but he he took that head kick he took some big shots he took huge he, shots in the first 90 seconds right. of that fight holy Christ he's like, he's like all right all right I'm I'm here let's go it I'll was, say this. It'd be great. I think I think that was what he was missing was the leg kicks. I think if he if he starts leg kicking uh Marias in that fight, he he comes out with the victory. Uh, you know, at 33 years old, he's younger than most people think because he's been around forever. Yep. And the other thing about that is it does seem like it's the wild wild west again. However, he made that way, he didn't look bad. Whatever he did, he didn't look bad. Like you said, he took big shots and you're right. I mean, at any moment, a couple of leg kicks in that fifth round even wins you the fight, right? I'm sure some of those judge, judges had to have it 2 2. Was it a split? It was a split, right? Was that the only split or no? Or was, am I wrong? Am I imagining that? Yeah, I remember the score because I wasn't listening to the, uh, I couldn't hear it. Oh, that's right. All right, let's move it down. Um, I'll tell you what, I didn't expect the three championship fights to run till almost 2 a.m. my time. I know that was, what, 11 years, which isn't that bad. But, like, usually these things are over by one or a little bit after with even one or two championship fights. Nunes mm-hmm. came out hammering. Um, you know, Durant may had a couple moments here and there. In like I think the, that's the first two rounds, yeah. uh, it, was, it was back and forth kind of even. Um, leaning towards Amanda, but like uh, Jermaine, she she landed some nice shots, and I think uh, Amanda wisely was like, "I right, stop fucking around, <laughs> take her down, beat her up on the ground." Yeah, like, no, you're right. Take, she clenched take, her. Take her past when she did get rocked. She took that kick to the head, and she's like, "All right, nope, yeah, that's right. I need to stop playing here." Well, even when she was trying to get inside and had uh, Nunez against the fence, trying to get those knees in there, you know. 
Both of them had their moments where their fingers were in the fence, fighting a little bit dirty, in my opinion. Um, Girls fight dirty. I don't think that either of them really expected to go five and had the cardio to give the full five. They, they both really, to me, faded in the fourth and fifth rounds. However, those the fading ended up with, what, Nunez in the more powerful position on top. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it was pretty obvious that she had won that fight. Kind of entertaining. I I think that, you know, it, it's tough, man. The, the the big fight for me was that, was that knockout for the women tonight. And how many of these fights really feel like top-level fights? Even that one, which is billed as one, in a five-round fight, was it? It's no Shevchenko, you know what I'm saying? It's no Valentina. Like, I, I expect that woman could take five rounds to anybody. Well, I, I don't understand anybody. In a title fight, uh, you're, you're taken down, and you're not fighting to get up or sweep. Like, what is your goal? What is your, okay, well, if I just don't move for a while, the ref will stand us up. <laughs> you're in a title fight. Like, you have to go take the belt. What are you doing? I don't get it. I don't get that mentality, but it's incentive. Humans are creatures of incentive, right? If you give us an incentive, we do things. So if you give people the opportunity to to be rewarded by lack of action or stopping the action, that's that's what they're going to do. It's easier. It's way easier than putting in the work and the energy and the effort to, to get up in the fight and in the preparation for the fight. I mean, again, the way I'm looking at it is that, uh, when you get to that level, there's only a few people that can really go five. And it's kind of sad that they got rid of Carmouche, who was somebody that could go five, takes that yep. Shevchenko fight because nobody wants to fight her. And then what happens? The UFC releases her. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like to me, Carmouche is somebody who does want to fight up. You know, we'll, we'll take somebody on. But maybe I'm just crazy. Um, no, like, that's just dirty pool. That's the way they do it. It's pro wrestling. Yeah. Finally, the final two fights. Max Holloway, who had another W at 145 just before this, and uh, fights Volkanovski. I had Volkanovski winning. I had him. I think. I think I had it three rounds to two uh, at, at the end of it, but pretty convincingly. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only thing I didn't like about Volkanovski is that he had those leg kicks going really early. They looked mm-hmm. awesome. He yeah. switched it. Why not go to a more? It's hey. like well, it, well when. Uh... Uh, Holloway, he switched his stance. So he yeah. switched, you know, left leg to right leg lead. Like, you stopped kicking the front leg. Like, why? I don't well, understand why. And, and the other thing he was, was... He was turning that leg purple on the other side. In the fourth and fifth rounds, he was throwing quite a few lazy head kicks. You know what I'm saying? They mm-hmm. came. And, and it's like, well, why are you throwing lazy head kicks when you've already got this guy's distance and you've already been successful with those leg kicks? I honestly... I feel like that's kind of a lack of the coaches saying, hey. No, that's, yeah, that's the number one rule in fighting, man. If you find something that works, like, do the shit out of it. <laughs> do the shit out of it until you win. If all you're landing is that jab, then just land the jab until their face is split open like a canoe and you won the fight. Yeah. Like, that, that's what it takes. If all you can do is land the calf kick, then throw 50 calf kicks in, the, in that time and, and beat them. Like, and the other thing works, was. works, keep using it. I mean, I mean for on, on Holloway's end. Holloway found some success with the one two, but never like the one two three. And when he w- was getting mm-hmm. success, like with a body and a headshot, he he didn't seem to be able to find more than one or two of those around. You know what I mean? Yeah. He went for the uppercut a lot, but he he whiffed on those a lot, in my opinion. You know, he didn't find the distance, and he's a little bit lankier. I think he has like three and a half four inch distance on Volkanovski. Volkanovski's a tough dude, man. Rugby, big big legs, man. Big old legs. <laughs> Big legs. I'm, I'm actually excited to see what he does in that division. I don't think he's mm-hmm. giving that belt up any, anytime soon. I know that he doesn't have a name that the UFC feels like they got to pay him. They had Holloway pretty mm-hmm. cheap. See, that that may be the next strategy that UFC starts doing is they start putting in guys as champion who, uh, who don't really sell, and they can use that against them as, oh, well, we're not going to pay you. We're not going to give you pay-per-view. We're not going to feature you because they're already getting the guaranteed money from the ESPN deals and everything else. So they don't need viewership from a name fighting with a title. They well, I mean, they, look, that. they got they rid of remember, Demetrius it's Johnson to one. They and, got a and, new and Big and Mac. And they knew it was a financially good decision. They said so after the fact. They made a better financial decision for their company getting rid of arguably the pound-for-pound pound best champion they've ever had, Demetrius Johnson, a mm-hmm. man who did a, 
a strike jumping arm bar <laughs> in one of the greatest highlights, but they can't sell him. So, and, and, I, and I like Ben Askren, but they, they said that was a better. Him. They don't want to sell him. They what? didn't want to sell him. He's too consistent. He's too, he's, he's somebody who's not going to be corrupted. They, they wanted to get rid of him. And well, I, again, you bring in Askren, he fights twice. <laughs> he's the better financial decision for him. Shows you the sport's kind of upside down and isn't a sport at all. And that That's brings good. us. Pro wrestling, guys. 100% pro wrestling. And that the fights bring... are real, but everything else around it is 100% pro wrestling. <laughs> that brings us to Usman and Covington. Now, before yep. we even get into the fight. And by the way, again, people should realize how good this UFC card was that we didn't talk about any other fights. We're 40 minutes deep. We could easily t- uh, tune in on this one for the next 15, 20. I mean, mm-hmm. UFC. Put more cards like this one together, man. And, and then maybe you'll have pe- less people bitching about the fact that you have it on ESPN fucking plus and the prelims are on ESPN too. So if you don't have a cable package and you still pay you fucking $65 for this stupid fucking thing, I can't watch six of the fucking fights? Like, are you out of your fucking mind, UFC? Like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> Excuse me. Like, Siri, you want $65 fucking dollars, but I got to have ESPN2 on top of it to enjoy Matt Brown, Ben Saunders. Right there. Right fucking there. That's incredible to me. And that's, again, that's what, if anything uh, killed boxing, you didn't kill it, but made it take a dip for a short period of time, it's the paywalls. 100%. <laughs> it's the paywalls. Putting everything on, on pay-per-view instead of letting uh, the big fights be accessible free on NBC Sports like they used to be. Paywalls. Paywalls kill things. Oh, they're trying to kill it. So, before we get there, I want to point out to everybody that, uh, where is it, the Covington thing? I know, here it is. So, right before the fight, pros react after Colby Covington admits that his UFC personality is an act. Let me just read this for people. All right? I've never told this story before, but uh, three fights ago, before I fought the number two guy in the world, uh, this guy named Damian Maya in Brazil... They had told my manager, Dan Lambert, that they weren't going to re-sign me. They didn't like my style. They didn't like that I wasn't entertaining. This is before I really started to become an entertainer and really understand the entertainment aspect of the business. Before this fight, they told me no matter what happens, I was ranked number six in the world. We're not re-signing you. We don't like your character. We don't like your fighting style. And I'm getting paid 30000 uh, to fight the number two guy in the world. After you pay taxes and pay your coaches, you're really going to get 5000 or 10000 Covington con- continued. Mm-hmm. All, all true. And, and again, he was a top-level guy. I liked the guy before because I actually like fights. Um, but, yeah, they were, they were totally screwing him. They wanted him to get beat by Maya badly. And, mm-hmm. and believe me, they, they don't love Maya. They don't want to give him too many title opportunities. Nope. <laughs> but they He's use him as a gatekeeper. You know, they do. So I go out there, and I beat him up, and I leave him in a pool of blood in Sao Paulo in his home city. I shoot this promo on the Brazilians and say, you guys are a bunch of filthy animals, and Brazil, you're a dump. So I go and shoot this promo, and I wasn't supposed to have my job, but that promo goes viral on the internet. That, uh, that the UFC is like, we have to keep him. We have to resign him because the promo is so big. So that's what saved my career, and that was the turning uh, point in my career. The rest is history. And that's when he adopts the MAGA persona in the next mm-hmm. uh, fight. And Yeah, he was just grifting because he had to. Like, he had to for job security. See, you call that a grift. But, like, <laughs> here's the thing. He tried to sell himself, and it's not like – he's a fighter at heart, right? At the end of the day, he's a fighter. And if you want to fight, you're going to do just about anything to do it. Now, to me, a grifter is somebody like, I don't know, Alex Jones, who says that Jesus told him to fucking destroy Joe Rogan, or that he talked to Q, or a a grifter is somebody like Rush Limbaugh, you know, who's uh, on OxyContin all the time, on his sixth wife, banging his secretary at the moment. God fucking knows. You know, those are fucking grifters. People that clearly don't, like Rachel Maddow. There's levels to it. There's levels to it. But, I mean, he's... He's stealing other people's stuff. He's saying things that aren't true just, just to make money. All right? So he's using the political scheme of things to do it. You know, I, I hear you. I just, I don't and, like to and, use And to top it all off, the worst part of it, the absolute worst part of all of this, like his, his problem, his issue that he just went through and had to create this character for, like 
wouldn't have had to happen under the Ali Act. Mm-hmm. He gets to meet President Trump. You think he fucking said, hey, support our bill, support the Ali Act so I don't have to act like this asshole anymore <laughs> so I can be an actual person and let my, my winning and losing dictate where I go and what I do rather than these freaking slave drivers? You make a great point, John Fitch. It's unbelievable. It's like, like uh, what I would have given to have five minutes with, with Donald Trump. <laughs> like, yo, bro, you realize that you had your guy like shelf our, the vote on our subcommittee hearing. Like we need, we need this. Like fighters need this. We need free agency. We need to be like every other pro sport. We're being uh, exploited. Please help us. We need you to help us. This is not American. This is a communist structure. The UFC runs. <laughs> we need help. Please help us. Chairman Dana, he's there. But Chairman Dana's just a puppet. Just like Chairman Mao is just a puppet mm-hmm. of the Rockefeller kissing. Yeah, machine, it's, it was the mafia owned Fertitas. <laughs> now it's the. Uh, the That's uh, the real mob. It's Disney. Now it's the real mob. Yeah, <laughs> Disney and WME. <laughs> yeah. The guys who covered up for Harvey Weinstein. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, we, look, you know, we haven't talked about. Well, let's go talk about this mm-hmm. fight. And then we could talk about how, yeah, as yeah. I told you, dude, he walked. And he you know walked. what? He didn't pay a yep. fucking dime out of his pocket. Yeah. Not a dime. He might have made money, bro. Like the insurance probably paid it off. Yeah, unreal. All right, so Usman Covington, what a fight! Uh, (laughs) What a fight! I think that the wrestling. I mean, my opinion for a title fight at 170, meh, (laughs) meh. These are the best two guys you got, meh, (laughs) meh. That's my comment on it. John Fitch <laughs> shooting on both these guys. What do you guys think? Let, let's come I mean, this up not the personal, over. but like, it's just that's more of a knock at the UFC. Mm-hmm. You're like, there's your Big Macs. All right, that's Big Mac. That was a Big Mac championship right there. <laughs> All right, so the fight itself. I have I have Covington in the first two. <laughs> I had him in the in the first half yep. of the third round until he started getting tuned up in the last two minutes, especially yeah, the last thirty happened. seconds. That last punch really, you know, something that was a driver. happened in the third round, and his speed, output, everything changed. I don't know if he started the third that way or he got hit with a body shot, but something shifted in his output in the third round, and it just started to go downhill from there. But I also, in the fourth round, man, I had him in the first few minutes. I thought in the fourth round he was winning that fight. In fact, when the, again, you weren't listening to the commentary, but like I'm listening to it, I already got it 2 1 Colby. And I'm giving it to him 3-1 in the first couple minutes because I think he looks nicer. And then all of a sudden, the last two minutes, don't get me wrong, Usman put it on him, and it was 2-2 going in. And then I'm like, even if you do give Kobe 3-1 and he survives, it's a 10-8 round, and then it looked like a 10-7 round, and then, you know, Goddard called it. I think it was the right move. I mean... Uh, I mean, it's a championship fight, though. It's like, tough. I, can see, I see both arguments. Like he probably would have lost anyways if you let it go. Yeah, but, but do you le- do you let Overeem you know take another shot with fucking three seconds left after losing his lip? Well, I mean he's uh, that's a lip. That's a big giant cut. <laughs> that's different. That's different than like oh he got dropped, but he's still in on a single leg. He's still he's still fighting back. He's still defending himself. He's still moving. I'll say this: like, like it reminded me a little know. bit of Frankie Edgar uh, Maynard fights two and three. But those, when Frankie was on the wheels and grabbing at the ankles and things like that, that was in the first round. It wasn't in the fifth. And I want to say, I'm not sure, it also kind of reminded me of Mir versus Nogira, where uh, Mir ends up fucking breaking, one of my favorite fights ever, ends up breaking um, Nogira's uh, arm after almost getting clean knocked out and his head is like literally in his ankle, shooting on an ankle. But again, it wasn't the fifth round. I want to say that happened either in the first or second round. So, I don't know. I didn't hate that stoppage. I understand Colby Covington hating it. You know, he wanted to go out cold. He already had thought he broke his jaw in the third. I guess we later found out he didn't. I think it was an exciting fight. I think you can sell a rematch on that as well. Exciting fight. It's fun to watch. Fun to watch. But, yeah, that's <laughs> what I was... I'm man on the on the, on the. Does Lima beat level. both those guys? What's that? Does Lima beat both those guys? Does Lima beat both those guys? Yeah. Well, I I now you know because I think he they wrestle him. You oh you do. That's a good point. Yeah. I think I think they, they that was the other thing about this fight is like what, they're not a single shot. Mm-hmm. Like what what uh, what were these guys told in the back? 
Seriously, John like, Fitch. Not even a single fight. Like, I'm not saying there was direct, hey, guys, keep it standing. But there's, like, incentives talked about. Like, they see guys get bonuses. They see guys get – like, you really, like, that wasn't a normal fight for them. What fight have they fought where they never tried to clinch or take a shot? It's weird. It's weird. <laughs> I don't know. They call, opinion. they call me the conspiracy theorist, guys. But I don't know. John Fitch with the conspiracies yeah. behind the scenes. I Folks. got my tinfoil conspiracy hat for Christmas. <laughs> Get on. Right? So I think it's very fishy that there was not any fights. Maybe the aliens came and talked to Dana. The aliens that live in Dana's butt came out and talked to them and asked them to just stand and trade punches the whole fight. <laughs> I'll give you a conspiracy theory, Fitch. You're, you might like this one. So um, you've been keeping up on the impeachment hearings, I'm sure, correct? Loosely. It's just so annoying. Nobody even cares. Like nobody even on the Democratic campaign trail is talking about it. If like the people who are running against the president aren't even bringing it up, mm -hmm. <laughs> like – you know it's bullshit. Everybody knows it's bullshit. Well, it is uh, quite the bullshiz, but as you know, there was a name of a certain whistleblower that you uh, were not no, allowed to say. Voldemort. Voldemort. We're not allowed to say his name. Now, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? I think I saw a video you were doing. Yeah, so, so Louis Gomer, it. a member of Congress... I didn't even say the name in the video. I refused to say it. I simply played the clip of him listing supposed whistleblowers that were supposedly um, going to be the witnesses that he wanted to interview. Joe Biden among them. And then Erica, Kara, I don't can't say the next part of the word and I won't say it. <laughs> I don't want mixed martial mindset to get the ban. So all of a sudden, YouTube has now locked it. I can click away. I can't do anything about it. The funny thing is that it was actually monetized after being uh, manually reviewed. This is one of the videos that has a nice little green arrow on it. So it's okay to monetize this video. It's just not okay to watch it anywhere, and it's been locked. And they said it was because I had misleading tags in the video. There aren't any tags in the video. Um, <laughs> I'm waiting for a response from YouTube. I just don't understand where we live in a world where I can't even... Um, can you, can you re-upload it? I mean, I could probably re-upload it with like a chicken sound where he says that name, but doesn't that prove my point? I literally named the video, John, when it went up. <laughs> I go, it was Louis says the forbidden name at the impeachment hearings. What will happen to this video? And it was live for it's about 36 a, it's hours. It's a crazy thing that, oh, we have this witness... And this witness is the per in, but no, we are not. No one's allowed to say their name. And it's like you the, know, real whistleblowers get out all the time. It's like the, it's like the Canadian the girlfriend. It sounds like the Canadian girlfriend. <laughs> like, oh no, you can't talk to her. You can't talk to her. She's busy. Oh like, boy. Johnfitch.net is the website, Ooh. guys. You want to go subscribe right now to official John Fitch. Um, tell us about uh, John Fitch knows nothing this week. What do you got planned? Uh. Man, I, I'm going to try to get the psychic on again this week. Let's we'll see if that works out. But um, yeah, I got some uh, some. I got to come through some topics. I got I got stuff in my phone that I that I save things I want to talk about. So I'll, I'll pick one that I want to talk about. Uh, yeah, I want to go through that Michelle Obama comments and Obama made some comments today about women just being better than men and women's friendships being better than men. It's just uh, it's interesting. Well, there's no way that Obama could be a closeted homosexual. I mean, that's not a possibility. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I can't imagine. That sounds like a Jason Burma's conspiracy theory. I mean, no, I, I don't know. Anyway, Stephen Chase, uh, thank you for the Super Chat, says Free Assange. Yes, I've done some stuff on that. I want to remind everybody, you can listen to this. If you missed any of it, want to listen to it on MP3. It'll be up at thegruelingtruth.com tomorrow. You can please, right now, go to at Jason Burma's on Twitter. Listen. Not asking for a handout. I'm asking for a retweet to make sure somebody who may have violently raped somebody, violently anally raped somebody, choked somebody, gotten bit by that human being. Punched an old man. Stop! Yeah, stop! Stop them from making half a billion dollars, or, or you know, stop them from making 
10 million, 50 million, we whatever need to, it is. Uh, rebrand his uh, whiskey. Uh, instead of calling it proper 12, we'll call it rape juice. I mean, <laughs> John, John, uh, don't you know what the new terms of service say on YouTube? You could be harassing somebody. Uh-oh. I mean, I mean, listen, again, I, I think that, you know what? We should have a competition, John. We should start <laughs> taping ourselves, punching old men in bars in the face mm. randomly. And see that how much works. it costs I think us. that might get me the fight with Lima, maybe. If I rape somebody <laughs> and punch an old man at the bar, you think they'll let me fight Lima for the title? <laughs> I think, in Ireland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so go give this a retweet, please. Right, tweet well. it at Dana. Tweet it at Connor. Let them know that you know that we're not going to stand for this. There's no January 18th fight. Remember, they're going to try to put tickets on sale on the 20th. Guys like Harvey Weinstein, they walk away. The Me Too movement was a joke. $25 million of insurance later, he's an old man. Remember I talked about Dennis Hassert being an old man in a wheelchair? And then what happens last week, John? He's an old man on a walker. Oh, he can't walk anywhere. Meanwhile, there's photographs of him the next yeah, day. Yeah, and they're trying to get sympathy for him. And Fuck off, oh, these people. Fuck. Oh, poor, oh the poor rapist. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh. Guys, he just cornered oh, no. a woman and jerked off can, into a plant. He can hardly sexually assault anyone anymore. <laughs> oh. Oh. What do you mean you can't rape a woman in Dublin? It's an Irish handshake, for Christ's sake. Oh, that's what we do here. <laughs> we call it the Connor. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, oh. if you want to financially support me, I've got the GoFundMe, $5, 10 $15. It means the world to me. We do this once a week right here. This is now, I think this is wrapping up month three. I think we got like 12 whole episodes. This might you be the 12th one. That's good, man. Um, and I guess next week will be the Christmas episode, John. So make sure wear a Santa hat and maybe something ugly. I'll make sure to do I'll the same. I'll be here with balls on. <laughs> with bells? Sorry. Here with bells on. Uh, the <laughs> Usman era, not according to John Fitch. It's well, the I mean, Big it Mac is, era. But this is what they've, yeah, this is what they've built. Okay. Big Mac era. All right, guys. Later on. Big Mac era. <laughs>